So again, welcome to the webinar today. We'll be talking about sexually transmitted infections and migratory and seasonal agricultural worker communities. This webinar is in partnership with the Valley AIDS Council and NCFH. For those of you who are not familiar with NCFH, we are a private nonprofit organization located outside of Austin in Buda, Texas. Our mission is to improve the health of farm worker families, and we do that by providing programs, trainings, technical assistance, and resources. Um, we're very proud to be able to serve the 174 migrant and community health centers in our network who provide primary care services to agricultural worker families. And one of the ways that we address our mission is through the Ag Worker Access Campaign. Um, this initiative was launched in 2015 um, as a joint effort with the National Center for Farm Worker Health, NCFH, and the National Association of Community Health Centers, NAC. We, along with health center staff and other ag worker advocates, knew that more could be done to increase access to quality health care for our agricultural workers and their family members. And so the result was the ag worker access campaign. Um, our goal is to reach 2 million agricultural workers in the health center setting. Um, we've seen uh, steady increases over time with a few um, highs and lows here and there. Um, we surpassed our 1 million halfway mark in 2019. Um, and then in 2020, due to the impacts of COVID-19 on health centers and the agricultural worker community, we did see a decline in those numbers, um, but we are very hopeful and excited to continue growing and moving those number for, numbers forward um, through the Ag Worker Access Campaign and all the hard work of health centers and ag worker serving organizations across the country. Um, and now I will go ahead and transition over to our speakers um, who are joining us today from the Valley AIDS Council. Um, we have Armando Molina, he's the Capacity and Development Trainer. And then we have Pedro Coronado, who is the Deputy Chief of Organizational Development. And so I will go ahead and pass the screen over to our presenters. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you everybody who's joining us today for, uh, for this webinar. Um, once again, it's an honor to be able to present to you all uh, and be in, and have this collaboration. Um, so we're going we're going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, as mentioned, um, Pedro Coronado, and we also have Armando Molina. We're going to be going ahead and splitting this uh, presentation between both of us. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so I do have a dis, uh, uh, disclosure statement. So um, I have been, you know, paid by pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical company to be able to do some presentations. Now, just to keep in mind that I am not going to be um, presenting or speaking of any products from this company for this presentation uh, and not getting paid by them. And Armando has no nothing to disclose. <clears throat> So we're gonna because we do get funded under HRSA uh, and Health and Human Services, we do not uh, utilize any type of brand names um, if we don't have to in our presentations. If we do, we try to reference it back to uh, its original name in, in terms of uh, not being a a brand name. <clears throat> Language is something that is constantly evolving, and we are aware of that. So we do try to make sure to avoid any kind of bias or stigma or using any stigmatizing language. So we want to make sure that, you know, we are creating a space where we're empowering people um, and even through the language that we use for this presentation. So please, if there's any language that we utilize that is a stigmatizing language, please let us know in the chat box so we can be able to make those corrections for future presentations. So we do want to make sure uh, that we do it, that we acknowledge that and we let everybody know. <clears throat> Uh, so for today, we're going to be defining some common risk factors in agriculture communities uh, that make individuals more susceptible to STI, sexually transmitted infections, uh, recognize basic signs and symptoms of common uh, sexually transmitted infections to promote early detection and treatment. And we're also going to promote effective preve uh, preventative measures 
to include safe sexual practices and awareness of available resources to reduce the risk of STI, uh, sexually transmitted infections within um, migrant uh, seasonal agricultural workers. So uh, full disclosure, there is going to be a condom demonstration of, uh, you know, uh, be inserted receptive uh, barriers, uh, condoms um, to, in this presentation. So we just want to, I don't want to say warn people, but just advise people that there will be that presentation uh, going on for educational purposes. <clears throat> So we're just going to kind of go over uh, the sex, uh, sexually transmitted infections. We can go to the next slide. So what is the sexually transmitted infection? Um, NSU, we will keep an eye out on the chat box as well as uh, or on the Q&A box, just in case anybody has any questions or comments. Um, so we break it down, right? So uh, a sexually transmitted infection is an infection that is spread by through sexual contact. Um, they tend not to discriminate, right? When we talk about STIs, um, it's usually people who are sexually active and it doesn't matter your race, social class, religion. If you're having any type of sexual contact, you know, you are susceptible to an STI. Um, if not treated, right, um, this can cause other health problems such as like pelvic inflammatory disease and fertility uh, ectopic, uh, pregnancies and, and even an increase of HIV transmission, right? So if you have an untreated STI, you can uh, actually, you're at a higher risk of acquiring HIV at that moment. And we are using the term STI, as you can see, versus STD. And it's, we're looking at the I here, right? Because this is at the point of infection, not so much when it already uh, turns into a disease, right? So um, it can be used STI, STD, but uh, we are using the term STI to make sure that we're talking about the infection itself before it gets to the stage of being a disease uh, where it can cause complications. Next slide, please, Armando. <clears throat> so in this um, image here, we kind of get to see the STI prevalence incidence and the cost estimate in the US when it comes to STIs, right? So, uh, you know, we, if I'm real bad with math, so I'm not even going to pretend that I can try this out, right? But we, we have 70 people in this, in this um, you know, we're not saying that people in this in this room have STIs, but if we were to say one in five people have STIs, right? That, that's kind of quite an alarming rate of, of, of people who have uh, an STI. And a lot of times because people don't even know they have an STI, right? So roughly in 2018, right, it was... Um, noted that around 68 million of uh, eight, uh, STI infections occurred, right? And this is how we were determined to have, we had one in five. Um, you know, so there's around 26 new million, uh, 26 million new STI infections in 2018. And almost half of those were amongst people aged between the ages of 15 to 24. So our, our, our young population, right? Um, and usually it'll cost around $16 billion in direct medical costs, right? So something that can be preventable, something that can be treated early on, you know, the ticket price of it doesn't have to go so high, uh, but it does once it starts affecting individuals, uh, as we mentioned, you know, if it causes, you know, PID or anything, anything of that matter. Um, so anyone who obviously who has, uh, you know, anybody who has had sex, right, could possibly get an STI. There might be some STIs in Armando, we'll talk about them a little bit later, right, that people might be, oh, well, I got it through a doorknob, you know, or sitting on a chair or on a toilet seat, right? There's like very, very, very few, all I can think of one only um uh, I guess we'll call it an STI, right? That can be transmitted, you know, through fomites, right? Through like a towel, sharing a towel or, or sharing underwear. Um, you know, if people do that, um, you know, that can be it, right? But other than that, it's sexually transmitted. Um, and as mentioned, right, usually young people aged between 50 to 24 more susceptible. And then we're looking at, you know, in terms of, you know, um, you know, what type of sexual contact we look at uh, gay, bisexual, or just men who have sex with men. Obviously, people who get pregnant, um, most of them, the majority must have had sex, right, to get pregnant, unless it was an uh, intro. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, you know, when it comes to racial and ethnic mi uh, minority groups, we do get to see a high number of people uh, of racial and ethnic minorities that are being most affected by STIs. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So like here you'll see like the state of STDs in the United States, right? Um, or STIs, um, they continue to kind of hit the nation pretty hard, right? So, you know, there was a decrease in chlamydia, you know, also when we look at gonorrhea, there was also a decrease since, you know, 2017, which is great. Um, although on the flip side, we saw a, a huge, huge increase since 2017 in regards to syphilis cases. And then when it came to congenital syphilis, um, you know, for newborns, you know, mother passing it on to the fetus, um, you know, that was a huge, huge number. There was a point to where there wasn't enough medication to treat, um, you know, people who had syphilis uh, using the traditional uh, antibiotic that they used because they were trying to make sure that they were saving it for, for you know, people who were pregnant um, and they had syphilis to avoid them passing it on to, to their fetus uh, and then their newborn, you know, being affected by it, you know, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, later on. But the, 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 you know, I guess, and it sounds like every year we're saying, oh, there's an outbreak of this, there's an outbreak of syphilis, uh, or there's an outbreak of gonorrhea that's resistant to antibiotics. It is, right? So it does happen. Uh, but syphilis was one of those things that, you know, one of these STIs that um, within these past few years, and especially right after the pandemic, that we saw huge, huge numbers, right? Obviously, a lot of it had to do because people weren't testing during the pandemic. And then after the pandemic, they were testing. Um, during the pandemic, even though there was uh, uh, um, you know, where everybody was supposed to be staying at home. Uh, not everybody might have listened, right? And they were still, you know, having contact with other people. Um, and then some of the SSTIs just weren't being detected, right? Because testing wasn't available. Um, you know, we go back over 100 years uh, with the Spanish flu, um, and it was kind of the, the same thing, right, where, you know, the, the Roaring Twenties didn't just bring fun and excitement after the pandemic. It also brought a lot of uh, STIs as well. Next slide. So just real quickly, right, like in terms of uh, bacterial STIs and viral uh, STIs. So, you know, an STI is caused by a bacteria and it can be treated with uh, antibiotics that can be in a form of a pill or of an injection. Um, they can be cured, right? So you can be able to get treatment for it and it'll go away. But as it goes away, it can also come back, right? And when we talk about it coming back, if, if, it, if a person keeps getting, you know, um, you know, uh, infected with, with an STI. Um, some of these STIs, like I mentioned with gonorrhea, for example, or chlamydia, some of it can actually be resistant to some of the medication, especially if if the, the antibiotic, the treatment itself is not taken the way it's supposed to be taken, right, as prescribed by the by the clinician. So, um, so it's super, super important that people who do have an STI and get treatment for it, that they do get take the treatment as the way they're supposed to, right? Now, when we're talking about a viral sexually transmitted infection, Infection, right, like HIV uh, or hepatitis C. Uh, well, with HIV, right, that's a virus that cannot be cured, as we know right now. There has been, you know, for those that might know, there has been a very, very few cases, like three or two or three of them. But those are very extreme, you know, cases of in terms of you know people being cured for for hep, for HIV. And there was like a whole different you know process that had to go through that. Uh, and a lot of a lot of times it was unintentional to even cure the the HIV. Uh, with hepatitis C though, uh, that's different, right? Um, roughly, uh, at least more than eight years ago, um, there has been a cure for hepatitis C. So people, uh, so there there is that cure for that viral STI because hepatitis C can be transmitted transmitted through sex as well. Um, so there is uh, treat there is medication for it that can make it go away. But people can also get hepatitis C again. Right. If uh, just because they got it cured once, it doesn't mean that can't, they can't get it again. Next slide, please. So some of the common risk factors, right, when we for STIs that we do see, um, if we want to go to the next slide, you know, uh, are, you know, a lot of times it, it does have to kind of go, it, it does go along with the social determinants of health, right? Um, but some of the common risk factors uh, besides lack of access to care, right, if you can't find, and it happens a lot, right? So you can't really find an STI clinic that might be available at all times when you need it the most, right? Um, you know, I'm not saying that people only have uh, sexual encounters on the weekend or on Fridays, right, or on Fridays when it's payday. But, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, some of 
these places that are that are going to be providing treatment or testing or anything like that might not always be open on weekends, right? Unless it's an emergency room, but then who wants to kind of like hike up, you know, a, a, a hospital bill just for treatment of chlamydia or gonorrhea or syphilis, right? Um, you know, obviously when it comes to condomless sex, right, and not using any kind of barrier to, uh, when it comes to to any type of sex, right? We're talking about oral, anal, vaginal sex, any body part that you're using, right? That has a mucus that can be able to attract that bacteria. Um, multiple sexual partners. If you know, you know, if you or yourself might be uh, a person that's in a monogamous relationship, making sure that you're in a dual monogamous relationship, right? That your partner also is only having sexual, you know, uh, encounters with you and not with other individuals. Um, so even though you yourself are not having uh, multiple sexual partners is your partner having multiple sexual partners, right? For those that might be as old as Armando and I, uh, back in the eighties and nineties, they used to kind of say, you have sex with this one person, you already had sex with these like a hundred other people, right? Because that person has sex with this person and that person and so forth, right? Um, lack of regular testing goes back to that, right? Where maybe it's not available when people can't get tested for, uh, uh, STIs or even HIV. Um, you know, and, and actually, I'm going to disclose this, right, because there was something that I wasn't really aware of until we started really promoting other preventative measures for uh, to, not to acquire HIV or STIs, was that, you know, when it comes to condom use, they'll say, how effective is it, right? What's very effective if you put it on correctly, right? But a lot of times, the percentage goes between 70 to 80% effectiveness of the condom, um, because a lot of times people don't put it correctly, they don't use the proper lubrication, and Armando's going to talk a little bit more about that, right? Um, so just inconsistent or incorrect condom use, which is why we're going to have that video. Uh, drug and alcohol use, right? A lot of times, you know, that um, liquid courage, a lot of times, does and not only gives us courage, but it also kind of uh, makes us not makes us not you know uh, make the best decisions, um, and it could lead to inconsistent or incorrect condom use, or just having multiple sexual partners, uh, and then just the health literacy, right? Uh, I think that's a big big. Uh, a barrier there and risk factor where we don't have the proper knowledge, right? Well, you know, like I, you know, as long as I, I do this, I can be able to prevent an STI, and maybe a lot of times it's not correct, right? So, um, whatever, whatever that misconception may be. Next slide, please. So we're talking about some of these risk factors, right? So there are uh, higher rates of STIs amongst, as we mentioned, right, some racial and ethnic minority groups. Now, it has nothing to do just because you're brown or black or a woman or, or you know, gay man or man has sex with men or bisexual, whatever the case may be, right, or a transgender individual. It just has to be with the social conditions, right, that most likely are going to be affecting these minority groups. So factors such as poverty, maybe not enough jobs for those individuals or in that community. Um, there's large gaps between the rich and the poor, right? If I don't have a doctor friend that I can just reach out to, or even something as simple as like, you know, well, I shouldn't say simple, maybe something as uh, a privilege that maybe where Armando and I have that we can be able to go across the border and go get, you know, antibiotics, um, like during our lunch hour, because we, we work right where the border's at. Um, that in itself can also be maybe a, a, a disparity there, right? So um, when we talk about low education levels, talking about even low literacy levels in terms of uh, knowing about HIV, um, knowing about STIs and, and, and even HIV. Um, so, and even when we're, when I mentioned about the fewer jobs, right, if we kind of think about the, um, you know, maybe the, maybe even just the fewer jobs itself, when we're talking about, uh, you know, migrant or seasonal agricultural workers is that, you know, the jobs that they have might be limited, right. Uh, to some of the skills that they might have, or it might be limited to some of what it's afforded to them. Right. So that in itself, it's putting them in a position where, well, I can only do this job that's Monday through Saturday from, you know, sunrise to sunset. And unfortunately there's not enough, uh, you know, places for me to go get tested when I go play on Sundays at the, you know, wherever I'm going to go play at. Right. Um, and then even we're talking about transgender individuals, right. Maybe having to resort to, uh, uh, 
to, you know, sex work in order for them to be able to have that livelihood. So, you know, when we're talking about these social determinants of health, you know, health equity is only achieved when everyone has an equal chance to be healthy, regardless of their background, right? So this doesn't matter race, ethnicity, income, gender, religion, you know, it, it should all be equal to everybody. So it should be. Next slide. Next. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Armando. Um, so, you know, uh, we're talking about, you know, um, migrant or seasonal agricultural uh, workers in the U.S., right? They are disproportionately affected by, you know, the intersection of uh, the epidemics, right, of HIV and sexually transmitted infections. A lot of times because of these untreated STIs leads to an HIV infection, right? So I, last week we had mentioned about, you know, that it's kind of really hard to determine uh, the risk of uh, people who uh, um, are agricultural workers, uh, but it ranges between 2.6 and 13 percent in terms of the HIV prevalence within that community, right? Um, keeping in mind that when the general U.S. population, the HIV prevalence is estimated to be 0.6%. So there's a huge disparity there, you know, within that community, right? And then, um, you know, rates for STIs are usually two or four times higher among Hispanic or Latinos uh, uh, than among uh, white Caucasian individuals, right? So at the same time, we're not saying that se uh, seasonal uh, migrant uh, agricultural workers are only Latinos because they're also Asian and, you know, African and from so many other different countries and uh, races and ethnicities. Uh, but, you know, from what we see in terms of the uh, the information that that the limited information that is available, this is what we see uh, in terms of uh, STIs. And we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, about that, about not having enough, enough information, right? Go ahead, uh, Mando, for the next slide. So I did see somebody that logged in from North Carolina, as I was seeing on the chat box. Um, so something so to kind of be aware, right, is that, you know, obviously in the South, there's just a lot of HIV, STIs, you know, um, for various reasons. Um, so what we've seen, right, in some of the, the, the information that is out there, um, that, you know, being among the states of the largest numbers of farm workers, North Carolina has high rates of HIV and stage three and STIs. So what we mean by that, right? So not only is the person diagnosed, uh, so they rank 10th, right, in the nation of reported cases of stage three HIV, what we also know as AIDS, right? So yes, they got, a, they got diagnosed with HIV, but then they also got a diagnosis of uh, stage three HIV, also known as AIDS. So 36% of the US population live in the South, but the region has 40% of all people living with HIV, uh, stage three HIV, and they also account for almost half of the new uh, cases of, of HIV as well. So um, although the incidence of HIV in other regions of the country has either remained relatively constant or even decreased, because we have seen a decrease, like as we saw with chlamydia, gonorrhea, right, or even with HIV, there has been around like a 13-ish, 14% decrease uh, within the years. Um, the numbers tends to increase always in the South, you know, for the most part. So um, it might be better in other parts of the country, but uh, the South tends to be the hardest hit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and, you know, so people who cannot afford basic needs, right, may have trouble accessing quality, you know, sexual health services, right? So in communities with higher, higher STIs, uh, sexually active people may be more likely to get an STI because they have a greater odds of selecting a partner. So the same, right, so if you're going to be in a, if you're going to be partying in a place where there, there's not going to be uh, enough resources to get tested for STIs or get treated, if you're playing in that area, you're you know, putting yourself a little bit more at risk. Um, especially when there's not any kind of protective, you know, measures being taken. So many racial and ethnic minorities may distrust the healthcare system, fearing discrimination from the doctors and other healthcare providers. This could create a negative feeling around getting tested and treated for STIs, right? Like how I'm not saying it's the most fun thing to go to the doctor. It's, it's a difference between saying, oh, doctor, my tummy hurts versus telling the doctor, oh, uh, there's a discharge coming out of my, you know, my penis or my vagina or, you know, my anus or something like that, right? Or it burns when I pee or this and that, you know, it might be a little bit, you know, different when you're having those conversations. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so obviously due to a lack of uh, uh, sufficient data on sexually transmitted infections among uh, 
agricultural workers, right? Um, there has to be some gain of understanding of the STI burden amongst uh, agricultural workers by examining infection rates and people who are not doing that type of work, right? Uh, for example, with Latinos, right? So if so, we can't category we can't say that every Latino in the U.S. is an agricultural farm worker, right? Um, so, but what happens a lot of times is that you know a lot of the data the people are not being uh, I guess the data is not being collected, you know, and in so many ways properly to where we can be able to identify the exact number of, of individuals, right? And the same thing goes to that not every agricultural or you know, farm worker is Latino, Latinx, Latina, right? We are, like I said, mentioned, we have people of other uh, races uh, and ethnics, ethnicities, I'm sorry, um, that are also uh, in this field. So it's, you know, it, the data can kind of be a little hard to, you know, limit it and hard to find and it's a little bit limited, right? But for those that work in organizations that do provide these kind of services, um, it's really, you know, it's important that we kind of identify and separate that. The state of Texas, and you can go to the next slide, Armando, the state of Texas, we can, I can say that uh, maybe in 2017, 2018, uh, when we're talking about data, right? Um, they weren't collecting, they weren't really, they were basically saying that um, the, and the data itself, they weren't separating uh, cisgender men and cisgender, cisgender women from transgender men and transgender women. So they were kind of all lumping all, you know, uh, trans women with uh, men and, you know, trans um, men with women. Um, so after they started separating the data, we started getting a better idea on how it's affecting those communities. So it, that's kind of what we see here too, right? And once we kind of start separating kind of what they're doing in terms of the work that they do, it'll be easier to identify that. Um, you know, we people of color are um, are going to be, uh, there's going to be a turning point in terms of demographics, right? So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we we might see that, you know, there's an increase, right, of, of certain uh, racial ethnic uh, groups. Um, it is projected that, you know, people of more than one race are going to be the fastest growing racial and ethnic group over the next several decades, um, followed by, you know, uh, people of Asia, uh, Asian Americans and Hispanic Latino Americans as well, right? So because of that, of this growing diversity, we wanna make sure that people are gonna be taken care of, right? So um, there, we're gonna be seeing this in our workforce, in our schools, environments, right? In social settings where not everybody's gonna look the way maybe we look, it's gonna be a very diverse group. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're taking care of everybody as we're seeing that change. Um, so, so Armando, you want to take it to the next slide? And I'm going to pass it on to Armando. Thank you, Pedro. All right, everybody. Uh, so this next module, we're going to talk about STI early detection and treatment. So when it comes to early detection, I really, that's, that's kind of, like smoking mirrors in a way because it's really difficult to detect something very early especially an STI because usually as we're going to learn here today is that STIs are usually asymptomatic however if somebody was to experience any signs of STIs that like Pedro had mentioned they probably uh, experience some discharge from the vagina or penis but sometimes they might think that it could be a UTI or a yeast infection or anything like that so they disregard it and they don't do much of it unless it's persistent, right? And that's if they even do experience any signs of an STI. Um, I, some might, maybe there's sores or bumps and around the genital thighs or, or the anus area. If that's the case, you know, it could be like, let's say syphilis, for example, there's gonna be open sores. If somebody was gonna experience any signs of syphilis, uh, the first signs of syphilis would be open sores. However, those sores are absolutely painless. They can't feel any pain from them. So somebody can have uh, a syphilis sore inside their mouth, on their anus area, they don't see it, or areas that they're not looking at or monitoring or anything like that. So they could have signs and symptoms. However, they don't know they have them. That's if they do experience those signs. Um, burning when they pee or painful urination, or urinating a lot, it could be a sign of an STI, itching, pain, irritation, or swelling of the penis, vagina, bubble, or anus, could be signs of an STI, or even flu-like symptoms uh, like fever, body aches, swollen glands, or feeling tired, fatigued, 
or uh, those could be signs of HIV later on. You know, uh, like last week when we explained with HIV, it's usually asymptomatic and somebody could, it could take up to 10 years before somebody sees any symptoms or signs of it. So um, just like HIV and these STIs, it's usually asymptomatic. And so, and if, even if they do see signs or symptoms, uh, they're probably going to mistake it for something else. Like for syphilis, for example, could cause body rashes. Um, and it's, you, and it's also called as the great imitator because it, their signs and symptoms could it like, it imitates other, uh, illnesses out there. So, but one of the things that syphilis does show on the secondary uh, syphilis is Palmer's rash. So if they were to have rashes of the palms of the hands and feet, that's called a Palmer's rash. That's usually a big sign of it. And also if somebody does see an open sore in their genital area or, or anywhere in their body and it's absolutely painless, that is going to be another big sign of syphilis. Um, so they should get tested as soon as possible. So if people really do want to detect an STI as early as possible, and this is not a prevention method, this is just going to tell them at an early state is to have routine testing for STIs and HIV. And the CDC guidelines for STI testing is for all adults and adolescents from ages of 13 to 20, 64 should get tested annually if they're sexually active. And to be honest with you, people are still having sex after 64 years old. So if they're 65, 70, 75, and they're still sexually active, they should still get tested for STIs and HIV annually, okay? And sexually active women, men of all ages uh, should get tested annually for STIs and HIV as well. If they're pregnant or planning a pregnancy, they should get tested. Uh, if a person is gay, bisexual, or there are men who have sex with men, they should get tested uh, at least once a year. However, if they have multiple sex partners and they feel that maybe they're more they're vulnerable of getting something like HIV and STI, they can test as early as to three months to six months. Okay, and anyone who shares injection drug equipment should get tested for HIV and hepatitis C annually. And people who have had oral or anal sex should really share that information with the providers so that way they can test them for, you know, oral swabs in the throat, swab the throat or the anus and test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Because the thing about gonorrhea and chlamydia or even trichomoniasis, and those are bacterial STI infections, they like to stay in the open orifices of where the person uses for sex. So it's they, uh, they can't get their blood drawn to test for chlamydia or gonorrhea or anything like that. So it's not in the blood. It just sticks around the open orifice that's being used for sex. So they could use a urine sample, uh, a swab in the throat, or the swab in the anus uh, to detect if the person has gonorrhea and chlamydia or even trichomoniasis or, or not. Uh, however, when they're doing the assessment, when they're, they are getting tested, they should share with their providers what body parts they use for sex so that way those body parts are being tested for. Okay. So this is a resource we want to share. Since we are talking about farm workers and people who migrate around the country, this is a great resource. We'll put this on the chat box as well. Um, I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen real quick, and then I'm going to jump into this, uh, where this link will send us. So bear with me a couple of seconds, and I'll show you where this uh, link takes us. All right. Can everybody see that? Okay. So I'm, this is where that link would send us. So on the chat box, can somebody send me a, a zip code, whatever zip code you're from, send me a zip code. I'll put it in here. So anybody in the United States can do this. All right. 29. Oh, somebody zip code. I lost it. I'm going back up. Hold on. What? 29, 730. All right. Thank you, Kanesha. So I'm going to go ahead and put that on there on the bar, on the search bar right there. And push search. And it should take me, it should show me where there's find free, fast, and confidential testing for HIV and STIs. So we're looking at Charlotte, North Carolina, and we can see South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control Division of HIV, STD, and Viral Hepatitis. So they're, they're either free or low cost, or probably it's going to be at a pay scale. 
for HIV and STI testing. The, uh, they, they only have male, uh, HIV male testing there, like sending through, through, the, through the mail. So the person will receive it at their home, they can test themselves, and then they can find out whether they are HIV positive or not. I have my own uh, opinions on, on that because I feel it's uh, important to have somebody there. However, uh, to, to give some encouragement, I mean, like support there. However, there is, when we look at option five, the North Central Family Medical Center main location, they do have free low cost HIV uh, and STI testing. And it also shows a list like chlamydia tests, conventional HIV tests, gonorrhea tests, hepatitis A, B, and C. Uh, vaccines, hepatitis C testing, uh, herpes simplex tests, and syphilis tests. And it, I, it's best to call that number, that 803 number, and to find out, um, you know, what kind of test is available for the person. Is it going to be free at a low cost? What What is it that makes them eligible or the requirements to, in order to get a free test? So if you are working with people uh, that, you know, that do migrate or they're probably moving away or anything like that, share this resource with them. So that way, if they do move or you can work with them, letting them know, hey, these are the resources there where you're going and you can get uh, tested for free at a low cost there. So this is a really nice resource I love to use. And if I go back and usually sometimes it'll tell me where to get PrEP uh, as well, you know, medication that prevents people from getting HIV. And Alexis has shared on the chat box this resources. So if anybody wants to get on there um, and want to know what resources they have in their area, you can get on there as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this real quick and then get back into the presentation. Just bear with me because we are going to share some videos and I'm probably going to have to do the same thing again. Okay, so when it comes to STIs and, you know, treatment you, and preventing the spread of STIs is three simple uh, steps. Talk about it. You know, uh, I know this topic is very stigmatized or even maybe taboo. Trust me, I do this kind of work with the school systems in Texas, and it's, it, it could be difficult to talk about this. However, it's important. Just like in the beginning slide that Pedro has shared, uh, one of the leading uh, groups of people getting STIs and HIV are adolescents from 15 to 24 years old. And that is because they don't, they don't, they're not well educated about this. And I think there was a question about North Carolina. You know, there could be multiple reasons on why North Carolina, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, you know, all these Southern states are having more high or higher prevalence of STIs and HIV is probably because of the low comprehensive sexual education in school systems. And so that is something to look into. So we want to make sure increased risk of giving or getting HIV is, you know, we want to prevent that from happening. Long-term pelvic abdominal pains. So that could be PID or an ectopic pregnancies, you know, an inability to get pregnant. We want to make sure that these complications from STIs don't occur for people. And it could even happen to men too. So if a, if a male has gonorrhea and chlamydia for a long period of time, let's say over a year, then they can have complica complications like epidermitis, which causes swelling and painful testicles. And it that's where their sperm is at. So it could cause complications of being, you know, get, having children in the future. So we, we want to make sure that these complications don't happen. And so, which is why it's so important that people do get tested annually, because if they are asymptomatic and they don't know they have an STI and they had it for a long period of time, then we want to make sure that they're not going to uh, experience any complications like PID or eptopic preg pregnancies or even uh, epidemitis in the testicles for men. So, what are some effective preventative measures out there that we can take? There's prevention methods out there. You can see that there's external condoms, also known as male condoms. There's internal condoms, also known as female condoms. You can see there at the image on the bottom right-hand corner. And then uh, there's lube as well. So when we talk about prevention methods, there's, there's those tools, right? However, there's sexual health literacy out there. People can learn, get well-educated about this. Uh, get the right information. Of course, the only 100% way of not getting an STI or HIV 
is abstinence, you know, abstinence from sex. However, we, we are realistic at Valley AIDS Council. We understand that people are, uh, most of the people out there are having sex. So we want to make sure that there are, there are options out there that they can take to prevent them from getting something like an STI. Substance use prevention, assertive communication. So when we talk about power dynamics in society or even power dynamics between patient and provider, we want to make sure that that person, that patient or that person in the community is well educated and has that sexual health literacy that they could even be empowered to be assertive in communication, not only in with their provider, or even society, but with their sex partners as well. One of the worst parts of my job was to give a positive diagnosis, HIV diagnosis to a young person, let's say a 13 year old, and they tell me, well, they didn't even want to have sex. They were manipulated into it or they were peer pressured into it and they didn't even want to. And that was the outcome for them. So, you know, educating them, feel, making them feel empowered and making and helping them be assertive to communicate to their sex partners on whether they're going to use a condom or not is super important. And not sharing needles is important. So not sharing needles. We want to make sure that word shares in there. That's the key word. So if a person does use needles uh, for drug use or, or even a homemade tattoos or piercings or anything like that, we want to make sure that they're not sharing those needles so they're not vulnerable of getting HIV or hepatitis C. When I did testings in the, uh, you know, incarcerations uh, for incarcerated people, one of the main things I would see was hepatitis C due to the homemade tattoos being done in there. Using lube, I wouldn't really say that's a prevention method with lube by itself, but that could be a harm reduction. So when we're talking about unprotected anal sex and all they do have is lube, it could prevent tearing from the inside the anal walls, which, which would, uh, you know, not would eliminate or be less cracks and tearings inside the anal walls. So semen can't seep in there or blood seep into the other way, like in the urethra or anything like that. So lube could be a really great harm reduction there. Using condoms consistently and correctly. So uh, today we're going to show a demonstration on that. So how to use it correctly. When we do these in person, I'll tell you right now, like oh, about 90% of the people in, in person when we do these trainings do not know how to use a condom correctly. And if, you, if a person is going to use lube and condoms together, they, ha they have to use water-based lube or even silicone-based lube because oil-based lubes will cause the tear, will cause the condom to tear during sex. And the number one reason why condoms tear during sex is because the condom was not put on correctly. And the number two reason is because there's not enough lube. Let me just look at the chat box real quick. All right, thank you, Pedro. So I'm gonna have to jump out real quick. I'm gonna show this uh, video on a condom demo for, ex for an external condom. So real quick, let me get on here. There we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Uh, Pedro, if uh, the sound doesn't come out or anything like that, please let me know. External condoms are barrier methods that you can use to prevent STI or pregnancy while having penetrative sex, oral sex, or playing with toys. So today we're gonna to talk about how to use external condoms properly, and I'm gonna use this little demonstrator to help me out. The first and most important part about using an external condom is making sure that it's actually still in good shape and effective. So you're gonna do that in two ways. First, you're going to kind of feel to make sure that there's still that little pillow in the middle of the condom packaging that lets you know that the packaging hasn't been torn, punctured, or ripped. You're also going to look on the back of the packaging for a expiration date. So at Tulane, we use lifestyle condoms. They keep the expiration date on the back. Other brands might put it somewhere else, but just look around to make sure that it isn't expired and it's still in good shape. Once you've done that, you're going to open the package. Remember, a condom loses its effectiveness if it's torn, ripped, or punctured. So you're not going to want to use scissors, your teeth, or anything else sharp to open the packaging. So to do this, just pull the condom right over to the side and use the perforated edge to rip down. Once you do that, what you'll end up with is something that looks exactly like this. This is an external condom. Another important thing to keep in mind with external condoms is that you don't want to 
um, use them inside out or upside down. So you wanna make sure that the condom kind of looks like a wizard's hat. A wizard's hat has the rim on the outside, whereas a beanie, which is an inside out condom, is gonna kind of look like this. This is how you don't want a condom to look. When it's properly placed, the rim is on the outside, and all you do is hold the very tip of the external condom Place it at the top of the penis or the sex toy and hold that tip to make sure that an air pocket doesn't get in there. And then really gently using the blunt side of your fingers, remember you don't wanna use your fingernails or anything sharp, you're gonna really gently just start to roll that condom down to the base of the penis. Once it's there, um, it's in good snug shape, you'll just check to make sure there's no air pocket and then you've properly put on the condom. When you're done and you wanna remove it, what you'll do is you'll, excuse me, you'll hold it um, at the base and hold it at the top and just kind of gently together in one action, pull it off. Once it's off, you'll wanna just make a little knot in it to make sure that the fluid stays in the condom. Um, remember, don't flush these down the toilets. It's not good for the environment, but it will also eventually plug your toilet and make your roommate mad. So the best thing to do is kind of just put this in the trash can and you're done with it. So that is how you use an external condom. Okay, great. So you're probably wondering, 90% of people don't know how to put a condom on correctly, right? So how is that? So the usually where it happens, where people get it wrong, is that they don't tip, they don't pinch the tip and roll it on at the same time. So if they don't pinch the tip and they use the condom like that during sex, it's going to cause it to tear because there's going to be an air bubble right on the tip of it. Okay, so pinching that tip and rolling it down at the same time is super important. It'll cause a con not to tear. And so if a person is experiencing, uh, you know, tearing from condom usage, then maybe helping them with that tip of like, hey, pinch the tip, roll it down. Um, she, she says wizard hat, it's going to look like a wizard hat on top of her palm there. You know, we're Latino, we say a sombrero. Okay, so it's going to look like a sombrero. If it looks like a sombrero, then it's going to be put on correctly. It's not going to be inside out. So that was for the external condom now we're going to show a video on the internal condom usage also known as a female condom and as you can see they're not there's nothing really crazy about these videos or that one they used a woody and here they're going to use uh same kind of tool so there's not any uh genitalia or anything like that so um it's safe for work so i'm going to go ahead and play this video let me know if it doesn't have any auto or any audio or anything like that please here we go now we're going to start talking about internal condoms. Internal condoms are a protective barrier that insert into the anus or the vagina to provide STI protection or protection against unwanted pregnancy. So just like with external condoms, the first thing that we're gonna do with internal condoms is make sure that the packaging is still good because um, a barrier method loses all effectiveness if it's punctured or torn. So we really wanna make sure before we even use a protective barrier method that it's in good shape. So I'm gonna look at the ex outside of the packaging. Um, I don't see any tears, any punctures. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is make sure that the condom is still good by looking at the expiration date. FC2 condoms are the only internal condoms on the market and they their expiration dates are located in the fold of the wrapper. Um, so I'm just gonna look, yep, my uh, condom is still in good shape and now I'm ready to open it. So just again, like external condoms, I'm not gonna use anything sharp to open this packaging, no scissors, teeth, fingernails, anything like that. And lucky for me, there's a nice little perforated edge right there. So once I tear it open, what I will pull out is something that looks exactly like this. It's just kind of looks like an oversized external condom except for it has a firm inner ring inside. For anal sex, we're gonna remove that inner ring, but for vaginal sex, we're gonna keep it in there. And so first, I'm gonna demonstrate how to use this for vaginal sex, and then we'll switch gears and look at how to use it for anal sex. For vaginal sex, I'm going to kind of uh, adjust this inner ring almost like you would a menstrual cup. Some people call them diva cups. So they start out like this, and you've got to kind of squeeze them into a little pocket to be able to insert it into the vaginal canal. And I'm gonna do basically the same thing for this firm internal ring. I'm just going to pinch it and so it turns into a little bit of a figure eight. And now it's in the right shape to be able to fit inside of the vaginal canal. So I'll take out my um, vagina demonstrator and I'm gonna use this to show you how to insert it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is keep it in this figure eight and I'm going to put it into the vaginal canal. Now the vaginal canal is a pretty um, firm, 
uh, canal that actually fits around the inner ring. So you, it will hold it in place. You don't have to worry about it popping up. So I can put it in and then readjust. I'm gonna take out my clean finger and I'm just gonna really gently put, start to push it into the vaginal canal. Now remember, if I feel any pain, discomfort, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing. I'll find a new position, um, but I don't want this to be painful or uncomfortable in any way. So I'm gonna really gently start to push it in to the vaginal canal and then suddenly I'm gonna feel it kind of open. It's no longer gonna be in that figure eight shape and now it's gonna be open and what it's opening around is just like a diva cop it opens and fits around the cervix and that's what makes the barrier from the fluid so it's gonna open up and it's gonna fit around my cervix once it's there I'm not really gonna feel it it should never be painful you might be a little aware of it but it shouldn't be uncomfortable in any way it should just kind of be up there and now you're ready for sex now an important thing with internal condoms that you don't really have to worry about external condoms because they fit really snugly around the toy or the penis is that with internal condoms, it is possible to actually miss the barrier when you're starting to penetrate. So whether you're using a toy or your partner's penis, you wanna really make sure that you don't accidentally kind of get excited and go around. You wanna make sure that you're actually going inside of that internal condom. Um, once you're done having sex or playing with your toy, uh, you'll just kind of give it a little bit of a twist to make sure that the fluid inside stays inside of the internal condom and then really, really gently just pull it out just like you would a tampon string, right? Once it's out, you'll put it in a knot, you'll tie a little knot in it and then throw it in the trash can. Do not flush this down the toilet. It is not environmentally friendly, just like external condoms, but with internal condoms, they absolutely will clog your toilet. So you definitely don't wanna flush this down the toilet. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about how to use internal condoms for anal sex. So I'm gonna bring out a slightly different demonstrator. And the first step for using this for anal sex is to remove the inner ring. And look how easy it is to fall out. It's not connected in any way, it just falls right out. You can just toss it off to the side. You're not gonna need it for anal sex. Now that you have your um, internal condom and it doesn't have a ring in it, you're ready to insert it into the anus for sex or to use a sex toy. So to do that, you've got a couple of options. You can either um, use a sex toy or your partner's penis to insert it. And to do that, you're gonna kind of put this external, or excuse me, this internal condom on like you would an external condom. Kind of just drape it over the shaft of the penis or the toy. And then gently with lots of lubrication, because remember, anus don't self-lubricate so when we're having anal sex we want to make sure that we're using a lot of good lubrication so we don't cause any tearing to the anus or we don't break or tear the condom um, so once we're really nicely lubed up we can use our partner's penis or a sex toy to gently glide the toy into the anus you'll notice I can't um, quite demonstrate this all the way but once it's fully in you'll hold the condom at the base and then gently remove your penis and now the toy is or excuse me the internal condom is nice and gently placed into the anus and ready to use for penetrated sex. Remember, just like with vaginal sex, it's easy to kind of accidentally go around the lip of the uh, internal condom, so you want to make sure that you're getting inside of it during penetrative or um, any kind of penetrative play. Now there's a second way that you can insert this into the anus. We don't need a sex toy or a penis to do that. We can just use our fingers. So a clean hand, I don't want any body fluid on it because remember my partner is going to be going into this so I don't want any of my body fluids inside of this inside of this internal condom I'm gonna really gently drape over the condom over either my fingers or my partner's fingers whatever I choose and use these fingers to gently glide the condom into my anus um, or my partner's anus. Again, I'm gonna hold it at the base and gently pull the condom out. Now you'll notice I'm using an unlubricated demonstrator and without lubrication, that condom kind of comes up with my fingers, but with lubrication, it would stay firmly in place. It would my fingers would really gently switch, uh, pull out and then I would have a really nice internal condom placed and ready for play. When we're done, I'm just going to twist that condom to make sure that anything inside, any body fluids inside of the condom stay in place. Gently pull it out and then toss it in the trash. Again, not flushing it down the toilet. 
So that's how you use internal condoms. And before we end, I just want to quickly note that with any safer sex supply, whether it be dental dams, internal condoms, external condoms, what's most important is that they're comfortable and that they don't cause any pain. So if internal condoms or external condoms are giving you some issues, switch it up, try something different, see if a different method works better for you. All right, so that is the demonstration for internal condoms there uh, for vaginal use or anal sex. So going back to the presentation. Um, so not only is it important to, you know, know these condom demonstrations, we're providing condoms and lube to the community. And those demos are super important because not only is it important to provide the tools, but to educate them on how to use it. But how do you engage with those communities? So one of the innovative engagement uh, that uh, Altamed had created in Los Angeles was this telenovela called Sin Vergüenza. And, it, and it's really about a family, uh, Salazar family, that how, how did HIV affect this family? It's because there's going to be stereotypes. Um, like the Latino community, the Latinx population, we, we just think that, oh, HIV is going to affect certain types of people. I don't sell sex for money or anything like that. I don't inject drugs. I'm not gay or I don't have sex with men or anything like that. However, this novella really shows that it can happen to anybody. It can affect any family. So this is just a really uh, awesome, innovative way to get this message out to the Latinx population. So if we'll share this as well. So anybody wants to ever check it out, all they have to do is Google Ultimate Sin Vergüenza, and you can see these in English and in Spanish. So we have one last video to share, super short. And it's gonna, it's like 50 seconds. So really this is a Ultimate Listo campaign. This is the prep campaign that they're they're using to promote prep. Um just show this real quick. I share this. My exit out. Okay, so I'm just going to share this video real fast. And this is how to engage in the Latinx population with PrEP. And this is the medication that prevents people from getting HIV, it helps prevent it. So that's their Listo campaign. You know, he, uh, the, he's ready, he's prepared. Um, so, you know, it's just a quick, easy way to get somebody's attention. Maybe this ca that can play a, you know, like on Grindr or on Tinder and like little ads or anything like that. She's showing a little video, getting their attention. Like, hey, there's prep out there. Okay, thank you so much. I think it's still playing the, the sound in the back. Oh no. <laughs> That's not good. But yeah, so um, also for, so for any kind of the condoms and the prep itself, also and get tested. Some of these organizations, as you're going there, as Armando puts up the, the final slides we have, um, is you know you, um, you can be able to find out there, um, you know where to get the where to get condoms. Some of them will actually deliver condoms uh, to your sites, right? If it's somebody who needs them, like this is I think perfect for anybody who works, you know, does agricultural work, farm work. Um, that they, um, if they can go to, uh, to pick it up, they can order it, right? And they'll be delivered to their house. Um, and then, you know, just uh, some of those last slides that we had uh, were about the services that we do provide at the Valley AIDS Council. You know, we are a one-stop shop in terms of services that we provide to the community. Uh, part of that, you know, we, we and we primarily service people here in, in the Rio Grande Valley on the U.S., uh, the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, but with our training arm, with the AIDS Education and Training Center, uh, we do provide additional training and education to any organization out there seeking that. And last slide, Armando, I think the resources, references, um, and then we have some resources as well that you can be able to access um, for additional training. And then we finally have our social media pages that you can follow us in, um, you know, so you can be able to access, see what other training programs we have going on. Thank you. Armando. All righty. Thank you all. Um, any questions? We're going to close this out.
Great. I don't see any questions so far at the chat, but we invite you to, uh, to share those using the Q&A or the chat. We want to thank you, Armando and, and Peter, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and this concludes our uh, recorded part of our webinar. Thank you for watching. And for those of you who are joining us live, please stay on the webinar for the evaluation and additional resources that we're going to share with you.